Good evening, and welcome to this, the uh, January 14th meeting of the Livermore City Council. Uh, I now call the meeting to order. Uh, let the roll call show that all members of the City Council are present and accounted for. Uh, I ask that you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, action taken in closed session. Mr. City Attorney, uh, was there any reportable action taken? Mr. Mayor, no, there was not. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, at the start of the meeting, let me just start off by saying that uh, there's going to be a few changes to the agenda. Uh, the Human Services Commission annual update uh, will be rescheduled uh, to February. Uh, and uh, 6.01, which was the direction, uh, discussion of direction regarding advisory body term limits, uh, <clears throat> I have uh, chosen to pull that, uh, and uh, uh, the, that's not quite ripe. So we'll, uh, that may be coming back, uh, and uh, it may just be postponed. Uh, so uh, um, with that, we'll go directly to uh, 2.02, uh, which is a presentation by the Alameda County Mosquito Abatement District. <clears throat> uh, Ryan Klosnitzer. That's right. I think I'm getting queued up here. Nice <clears throat> to see you again, Mayor and Council. Um, for the we sake have the of the longest sitting uh, uh, representative on that uh, yeah. uh, that committee. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Jim Doggett yeah. um, has been on with for 41 years. He just got wow, reappointed. That's awesome. And he makes it to most most meetings, if not all meetings. So yeah. he's been very. Um, we're lucky to have him. So. Um, yeah, thanks for having me again. Uh, in the interest of time tonight, I timed this out to about 10 minutes, so it won't be a long presentation. Last time I was here was about two and a half years ago. Uh, my name is Ryan Clausenser. I'm the general manager of the Alameda County Mosquito Abatement District. For this, in this 10 minutes, I'll just go a brief history of who we are as an independent special district, why we exist uh, to control mosquitoes. Why we control mosquitoes is the health threats, the diseases, how we control mosquitoes, how we will be controlling mosquitoes, and the partnerships that we use to control them. As a mosquito district, we have in our constitution or the state, uh, health and safety code has that every city in our district has a, a, a appointed trustee by their city council. So we have 14 board members. Each, uh, as you can see, our Mr. Doggett is down here from City of Livermore. The presidency uh, rotates annually. We, this board of trustees has allowed me to have a budget of about four and a half million this is just a cutoff from my personal property tax in Alameda, and it shows that we have a $1.74 tax that was passed in 1983, a special tax, and a special benefit assessment that was approved by over two-thirds of the voters in 2008. So it capped at two, with, it allows us to go up to $8 now, but we haven't risen it since 2008 at 250. So with that, plus the ad valorem, nine ten thousandths of a percent, that brings us to about four and a half million. With that, with those funds, we're able to have 17 full-time staff and five seasonal staff. Again, we haven't raised uh, revenues in 10 years, even though I have the ability to, but we've been able to have the field staff, and each one of these shaded areas are where the technicians are assigned, if you will. So um, out here, uh, the gentleman is Mr. Tom McMahon. He's been out in this area for a while, quite experienced, and each of the technicians controls the mosquitoes in their areas. We also have the laboratory research staff and administrative staff. Mosquitoes and aquatic insects, a little biology review here, that they spend most of their life in the water. They uh, have a complete metamorphosis, so they go from eggs, larva, pupa, and hatch to adult. And they breathe, so they have to breathe during this process. So that's why you don't see mosquitoes in wavy conditions or other conditions, because they won't be able to breathe. These are just a list of pathogens that are found in Alameda County. Uh, necessarily, we don't have the mosquitoes that will transmit them, I just, you know, I'll get to that later, but at least you've probably heard of West Nile virus, has been here about 15 years now with the other encephalitis mosquitoes. Heartworm, which is caused by a mosquito that hatches around the spring equinox and tree holes. Um, malaria, which you need to, another person to have that to be spread, but we have that mosquito. And then these last four are all spread by an invasive mosquito that is not in this area yet, but is slowly migrating north from Southern California, has made as far north as Los Banos. There are 22 species of mosquitoes in Alameda County, and they all come from different places, so that's how we can identify where to control them. 
Two of the ones that I'm just going to touch on here are the ones that spread West Nile virus. It's still, it's endemic. It still uh, causes many people to get ill in the state, and uh, it's still fatal. But these are the mosquitoes that come around in the summer. They're small. They come out at dusk and dawn, and they, they spread West Nile virus, which is actually a bird disease. So they get it from the bird. They prefer birds over humans, and coincidentally, or they will attack humans and then spread the disease that way. The other mosquito, which I alluded to before, is the invasive mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus. It's slowly migrating its way north. It's about this far now. We're looking for these because if that we have that mosquito, not only are they a vector of diseases that we currently aren't being spread, but they are very aggressive. They bite during the day, and they attack you in your elbows and behind your knees. And the, looking at our partners in Southern California, the number of calls to our district goes up by 50 times after these things come in. So we're already preparing for this. <coughs> How we control mosquitoes is just the circle here of knowing what we're looking for, how to control it, using some quality control, and also the methods and partnerships, which such as uh, street events and whatnot. The traps, as I mentioned, we have over 700. Our two staff members basically cover all these traps within a month. They set them down, they collect them, they identify them back in the lab. And these, the blue ones are looking for this mosquito that doesn't exist, so it's a lot of nothing which is good, it's boring, but it's, you sh you're looking every month, there, the mosquito is not here yet, that's a good thing. And the rest of them monitor the, the mosquitoes that are currently in existence. The nothing trap, as I'm saying, is this right here. It's just a, a bucket of dirty water, really. It's attracted to that breed of mosquitoes, and you look at the paper and look for these little dots where they lay eggs. Otherwise, we use CO2 or a pheromone sort of trap, and it uh, mimics an, a mammal breathing. CO2, so it thinks it's getting blood. Instead, it gets sucked into this trap, and then we go back and test it and see if it's got diseases. Otherwise, we can just take a, a, a dip stick with a hole, and we dip it in the water and look for the mosquitoes inside there as well. So that's the way we actually look for these mosquitoes. When we have it on our laboratory in Hayward, we test the mosquitoes for disease. We use QPCR testing, look for the disease in the mosquitoes so we can focus our attention. We also look, test the mosquitoes for resistance to certain pesticides. We don't, we use birational products, things you can buy at the hardware store such as BTI. Uh, that's our main product we use. But if we do have flying mosquitoes that have diseases, we need to control the adult populations. And then we have to make sure that whatever product we use, the mosquitoes aren't already resistant to it. I think the last time in Livermore we did a uh, fogging operation was in about 2013, so it's been about five years or so. But that is a situation if we have those high numbers of high-risk mosquitoes. Otherwise, some of the operations haven't changed much in about 50 years. We have, this is from the 60s and this is from today. Uh, a lot of mosquitoes are found in storm drains. Another way is out in the marshes. This seems like a far away from you out here, but these mosquitoes can actually fly about 25 miles or so. So they do uh, bite their way up the hills and over the hills. And a lot of the work we do in Livermore as well is uh, planting mosquito fish. I know your nurseries here give a fish giveaway. We partner with them and we provide fish free to the public. If they have a swimming pool that they don't want to swim in anymore or a fish pond, we'll, we'll drive out here and give you guys mosquito fish. Or you can always come to Hayward as well. We grow our own fish. And last, we used to do a lot of the, our, uh, my predecessors were all engineers. And that's transitioned from this heavy work to this. <laughs> and even this takes a lot of uh, permits and regulations to get that sort of work done. But it, what it does is it allows for natural tidal action so we don't have standing water. So it actually creates a more healthy wetland with having just some small ditch work. Other ways we work through is trips to the S Sacramento, uh, speaking at academic conferences, speaking at forums such as this, and doing social media and events. Telling how we know what our work is, the impact we're having since we have a small staff and we're very proud of that efficiency. We use a lot of business intelligence such as Tableau, such as Microsoft BI, and look at the different levels where, where we should be focusing our attention, where we should be di diverting staff. This last third of the presentation is really gonna be about what's next now. What are we, we've kind of talked about the last 50 years, mosquito control is a very small market. A lot of, not, a, not a lot of new entrants to the market, so we have to be creative on how to move, tackle this in the future. With that, we have a lot of financial pressures, which are shared by a lot of government agencies. Also, have this new mosquitoes, I've mentioned a few times, 
And with climate change, we have to find out how this affects our work in mosquito control. So financial planning, I'm sure, like as I mentioned before, $2.50 is what we have now. We could raise it to $7. You know, that is our, we have that authority, but I don't see that happening. You know, I think with the way we do, and we work on an efficiency and some automation rather than raising our revenues. And we've done other work with our board to have some potential stabilization. We put money away to when our unfunded liability to augment that, we have another trust fund, and also with some reserve funds as well for our capital replacement of vehicles and whatnot. A lot of research is going into other approaches rather than pesticides for controlling mosquitoes, such as uh, irradiating them. Uh, you zap them with x-rays and create sterile male mosquitoes, and then they can't mate with female mosquitoes and the population goes down. Another product uh, project that's going on in Fresno right now with uh, Verily, which is a subset of Google, which is working to infect mosquitoes with a Wolbachia bacteria, and it's slowly driving the numbers down, same way that creates sterile male mosquitoes. And CRISPR technology, trying gene drive, which has not been used yet, but it's being considered in a few places. But there are some, um, you have to think these things through before we start working gene drives of mosquitoes, I'll just say. Uh, the other thing we're doing is working with cities. I know we've just been communicating with your uh, public works staff on some of these trash capture devices that were enforced to r reduce the amount of trash in the waterways, which we're all for, of course, but some of them can be very problematic. Once they lock them us out, we can't get in there and look for water, so we've been working with the city uh, and other cities to say, hey, if you're going to buy a thousand of these, just buy this model. Try not to buy this model because it'll just create lots of headaches for us. Otherwise, when you build bioswales, we just look at the design and the design phase to show that they're not holding water for more than two weeks. As long as they flow, then we don't have to be out there. Another working with wetlands, we, since the beginning, we were founded because of the wetland areas and working with the agencies, with environmental agencies when they are doing a lot of these measure A funds, restoration work, let us just be in that room to say, hey, we want to be out there kayaking and involved in the community, but we just don't want to get eaten alive by mosquitoes. And we don't want to be out there having the impact of our people out in that area. So if they design it, if they have to redesign these wetlands, do it in a way that is sustainable. And one of the ways we measure this now is we have a drone technology. Mostly now it's all used in the wetland areas to, instead of walking, as I've said, a lot of this areas we can't even drive on, we have to just walk with a bucket for a mile, just look for water, and then walk back. This way we can fly and map out with multispectral cameras to say there's water here. And then we can, we don't have to walk all the way out there to check it. So that's one of the technologies this is off of um, in the Newark area, but that's this new technology we've had about a year now. And uh, eventually this will be used for some treatments in those areas as well. Not over habitat, habitat areas, but more in the wilderness more. And again, it being a smaller agency, we tried to work with other partnerships. We're the lead agency with the Chan Zuckerberg BioAB, uh, sequencing the gemo genome of a lot of mosquitoes so we can find out better ways to, I guess, kill them. <laughs> and also find out what other possible diseases mosquitoes may be spreading that we don't, aren't aware of yet. And also with other um, Cal State East Bay, Berkeley, other associations, other cities and districts to reduce the costs to provide services to the people the best we can. My last slide here is just really what we work on in Livermore. A lot of it is, in the, you know, some of the creeks and channels. We were looking at some of the work that Zone Seven is doing on um, some of their plans to make sure, again, if they're building it, do it in a way that's sustainable so we don't have to continue to do mosquito control there. Some of the parks, the gravel pits, the wastewater treatment facility. Again, if it's just some slight adjustments sometimes of moving water, then we don't have to be in your doing the control areas. So, and the swimming pools are the main thing as well. We probably have about 200 swimming pools that people have left green in Livermore that we have to come out. And usually we just give them fish and say, just call us if you need us. And that's all we really need. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm here. Great, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Any other questions? I have a Great. Fine. So I am not a fan of mosquitoes, mm -hmm. but I do wonder about their place in the ecosystem and what happens if we get rid of them, which I'd dearly love to do. <laughs> you know, people have looked at this. I really don't think there's a chance of us eradicating mosquitoes. 
there was a push in some places back in the 40s, I think when DDT was all the rage. Um, we kind of found out what happened there. And it, 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 they, they got rid of some species of mosquitoes in America and in Brazil, but it found its way back. So our thing is to really control them and focus on the ones that really do the most harm. So that's really what it is, is controlling the mosquitoes to a level that allows for human health and comfort. So. Years ago when I worked at the uh, Hayward Wastewater Plant, we did a lot of work on chironobin midges, which are non-biting. Mm -hmm. uh, but they fulfill very much a, a similar sort of niche, the mm -hmm. food for fish and uh, biomass removal from, uh, from waterways. But I said, yeah, there's, there's, they're out there. So, I, so we I, can just replace I, them, in other words, <coughs> mosquitoes with yeah. midges. Yeah. yeah. So, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I would just like to say it was a great presentation, and it, it's very impressive what you've done with the, with the small staff and the budget you have, mm -hmm. and it, it just seems like a very sophisticated operation, and you, it's the first time I've really actually learned, you know, much more detail, so thank you. Well, thank you, and thank your board, and mosquitoes.org is our website, so it's really easy to remember. We were able to snag that back in the 90s, so, um, but again, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate working with the city of Livermore. You've been good partners in the past, so thank well, you. Well, one of the things, you, it's, it's, you have the photograph in here, but uh, discarded tires mm -hmm. uh, are a real source of mosquitoes. Yes. Discarded tires and old uh, planter pots that people just have in their backyard, they collect rain, people forget about them, mm -hmm. and they start growing mosquitoes. So yeah, that's the main cause of this invasive mosquito that comes up. It's uh, in LA, for example, they have to go door to door with toothbrushes and scrub because you can dump the water, but the eggs still stay intact on the planter pots. Yeah. So they've had to hire hundreds of people from mosquito districts down there to just go door to door and scrub people's planter pots. That's what wow. it's kind of come to. <laughs> so well, I'd rather work. not do that, but I mean, <laughs> that's what we're kind of, we're ready for it if we have to. Well, great work. Thank you ever so much. A tremendous it. service for, for the vector control. Thank you. Okay, that's it for proclamations and presentations. On to uh, Citizens Forum. These are items that are not on the uh, uh, council agenda. The council cannot deliberate nor take action. Um, and I ask that you keep your comments to uh, three minutes or less. Uh, we have uh, Greg Scott, uh, Van Rainey, and Connie Copps. Mr. Scott. I am Greg Scott. I speak on homelessness in Livermore. I speak on homelessness because it is wrong morally and ethically. Homelessness is vile. It is a degradation of community health and we are all part of community health. If anyone in the community thinks they are not affected by homelessness, then I contend they are highly distracted and or deluded and or steeped in naivete. Often I have heard in this chamber that good government is, quote, by the people, of the people, and for the people, unquote. Given that, in regard to homelessness, I ask, what is going on? on people. We are chipping away at the problem of homelessness when this problem has all the potential of metastasizing into crisis. We put City of Livermore staff through bureaucratic contortions and perturbations and expect what? Impossible or highly improbable miraculousness? Hallelujah. Yet the problem remains, much as it did 12 months ago and much as it probably will 12 months from now. Pollyanna, Panglossian pronouncements such as this headline, Quote, report says county can end homelessness by 2013, unquote, in the latest, the independent, are not going to accomplish any such thing. I read from the article, quote, the homeless problem continues to worsen in Alameda County, but it can be turned around and solved by 2023 by increasing spending to $333 million annually. This is the conclusion of a 46-page report from everyone home a nonprofit organization founded in 27 to deal with the county's homeless problem, unquote. Nonsense. Look, I do not doubt that the nonprofit Everyone Home is doing significant good in regard to the homelessness and have their hearts in a good place. However, this article's premises and therefore conclusions are wrong. We cannot continue throwing ever more money at the homeless problem and expect the problem to be solved. By the report, it can be 
deduce that just over $105 million is being spent on homelessness in Alameda County. The report lists the 2017 homeless point in time count is 5,629. Thus, over $18,600 per year is already being spent on each member of the point in time count. The uh, Everyone Home proposal would increase the spending by $228 million per year or triple the amount being spent now. Do you all think that $241 million spent by the City of San Francisco Department of Homelessness is solving the problem of homelessness in San Francisco? If yes, then go to 300 Hayes and have a look. But please, do not step in the used hypodermic needles or step in the human feces. We make significant headway on the homeless issue when we realize that spending ever more money on the homeless issue is not going to solve the problem. As founding father Thomas Jefferson said in 1773, quote, the glow of one warm thought is to me worth more than money, unquote. We need reasonable warm thoughts on homelessness, not half-baked thoughts. Please, change your thinking. Thank you, Mr. Scott. And uh, again, this is uh, a huge issue for the entire Bay Area. Uh, in the middle of the wealthiest part of the entire United States, the Silicon Valley, in the heart of the Silicon Valley, Ravenswood School District, 23% of the children of the Ravenswood School District are homeless. That's over 800 children in the heart of the Silicon Valley. And there's people, there's some very smart people over there, as are in San Francisco. And we will continue to work on this. Uh, and we will continue to work until we find a solution. This is not easy. And I'm, I'm sure you understand that. And I certainly appreciate your passion. Thank you. Van Rainey, uh, Connie Copps, and uh, Andrew Barker. Mr. Rainey. Evening, Mayor, City Council. My name is Van Rainey. I live at 816 Lucerne Street. And I'm here to basically re respectfully request the City Council and the Mayor to consider the establishment of a commission on the environment, the uh, energy, and climate uh, change. Basically, what I'm looking for is some kind of guidance on how we might be able to help advise the City Council on a wide range of issues dealing with how the EBCE program is rolling out, especially in the face of PG&E possibly declaring bankruptcy, um, how we might be able to deal with the newly adopted Title 24 uh, changes to the building code, the re-establishment or the updating of the climate action plan for the city of Livermore, um, working towards uh, promoting Earth Day in 2020, which is going to be the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And basically what we're looking for, or what I'm looking for, is some kind of guidance on how we might be able to most effectively establish a commission, which would be of most benefit to the city council. and guide us in what you think would be necessary to move such an action forward, what kinds of people you might like to see as endorsing or supporting such a measure, um, and you know how we can make this particular kind of effort um, worthy of the existential problem we face with regard to climate change. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Rainey. Uh, Connie Copps, uh, Andrew Barker, John Stein. Hi, um, this is Connie Copps, and I'm here also in um, uh, for my business, Use a Bag, A Lot of Bag, which started years ago, um, and it was a gift of an idea that came to me um, to help solve problems, you know, some of the problems that were just discussed, homelessness, the environment, and um, what brought me to tears before I was listening to Greg Scott about, you know, some of the people were losing to drugs um, and, and the... Um, I don't know, the economics of it. And for years, I think people have looked the other way to the economics of a lot of things because um, we need our money to keep going. Um, but I really appreciate his heart. And he's almost moved me to tears, as you can kind of hear in my voice. Um, but many years ago, I contacted um, the city of San Francisco, the city of Oakland, the city of Livermore. Um, as we were, I mean, I know San Francisco, I didn't know then that San Francisco was a sanctuary city, um, but I had an idea, and um, it was to help 
our charitable organizations actually to fund our social help our under fund our help fund our underfunded uh, social security. And it was um, about re rewards club points being used in a different way and our lottery put in a different bag that encouraged um, kind of what General Mills calls be good points now. Um, but mine, uh, my main focus for me was uh, to put um, the uh, focus um, to encourage the reuse of bags by also like buying um, in support of a charity. You might, you know how the lottery helps our school. Well, the um, buying a bag, like saying even in support of um, our economy, like our wineries, uh, in support of our housing, in support of our schools, and we don't want to take away from our schools, um, but we want to support these um, organizations and this infrastructure in a way where everyone can participate. And um, I don't know when the state of Oregon started doing, um, they voted on where their lottery dollars went, um, but I thought, you know, this is a way of people could kind of vote where some of their lottery dollars were going, because schools are important, but I really think, you know, especially as being a teacher and a mom and a, a mom who, uh, who has seen many friends die under the age of 50, way too young, heart problems, things that shouldn't be going on. Is it stress? What's happening to these people? Why are they dropping off like this? I didn't know. But I did, um, I was really interested in getting in touch with Andrew, our new innovative person, um, because years ago, um, well, I wanted to pitch the people again. Um, back when Gavin Newsom was mayor of San Francisco, I was dealing with, you know, the, um, I don't know, their um, environmental person, Wade Crowfoot and Lauren, whatever her name was at the time, I can't forget, Ron Delms, this goes back a long time. So I'm really hoping to get together with Andrew. I sent him a letter to follow up on this and I'm gonna pitch um, General Mills next week, so have him give me a call, 925-449-1658, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Cops. Uh, Andrew Barker, John Stein, Carl Wente. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I was heartened to see that you uh, explicitly added public safety to the city's mission statement last week. Um, I know that when I hear, especially Mayor Marchand, but also the rest of you speak, that you often say that public safety is really the, the linchpin of everything, that it's the foundation of everything about our quality of life. I'm a little um, unsure that you understand what our, our largest public safety problem really is. I uh, came to this conclusion at the 2018 Candidates Forum at Livermore High School. Uh, there was a question about what that exact thing, what our biggest public safety threat was. Um, Ms. Monroe and Mr. Warner were both there and both gave a wrong answer. And I'm not sure the rest of you would do much better. Um, so to, to get there, let me do a, a very incomplete review that I found just kind of by Googling of some public safety incidents from 2018. On March 3rd, there was a young man nearly killed by a driver at Maria Van Huren while walking his dog. On July 11th, a driver severely injured another young man at Portola and L Street. On October 9th, a woman was injured by a car while walking at First and Maple. On December 17th, another driver badly injured a teen on his bicycle on his way to school at Maria Van Cedar. This is just a small sampling. Um, you should ask your police department. I'm sure they have very good data. In September, they reported that Six pedestrians have been killed in the last three years and 57 injured. Um, in California, two pedestrians are killed by drivers every day. I have this list on my sheet of paper. I encourage you to just Google it. Um, people aren't really being shot in Livermore. People aren't dying in house fires. People aren't being maimed by mountain lions. But we do have carnage on our streets. Um, and you are partially, I, won't, I don't want to say responsible. That's the wrong word. You're, you're involved. You, could, you have a role here. I could give a long list of things to do to improve it, but I'll, I'll focus on just one. You should narrow streets and narrow traffic lanes. Right? The basic problem here is that speed kills. And in California, unfortunately, you can't really change speed limits, and you can't really enforce the speed limits you have. I think you know that. So in order to get drivers to slow down, you need to change the design of streets. You need to change their configuration. Um, 
narrow traffic lanes are a simple and relatively inexpensive way to do this. They've a proven effect of slowing traffic and improving pedestrian safety. And um, in general, the studies seem to indicate they don't really lower traffic flow if you do them in an intelligent way. So if you think public safety is really part of your mission and one of your top priorities, I would direct your staff to make it a priority to have narrower streets and narrower lanes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barker. Uh, John Stein, Carl Winty. <clears throat> uh, good evening. My name is John Stein. I live at 1334 Cathy Court in the city of Livermore. Uh, I'm somewhat concerned about the a change which gives responsibility for street trees or will give responsibility for street trees uh, from the city to the individual homeowner. Uh, large, mature uh, trees are an important amenity uh, to the city. Uh, they're part of our infrastructure. Uh, we assign value to gray infrastructure, streets, sidewalks, storm sewers, buildings, uh, but uh, often do not assign a real value to green infrastructure, which is the <clears throat> landscaping and trees that are in the city. Uh, assigning responsibility to the individuals, some individuals will take good care of their trees, others will sort of adopt a policy of benign neglect. Uh, some people will not know, you know how, which tree to plant, how to plant it, how to prune it, uh, how to water it, uh, and even how to remove it if it dies. Also, in times of drought, uh, uh, many individuals will not have access to reclaimed water to uh, uh, provide water for the trees. Uh, so my, my concern is that one of the <clears throat> unintended consequences of doing this may be a loss of a significant amount of the a green canopy in the city, uh, which will affect the quality of life uh, and in the long term reduce uh, property values and uh, uh, the taxes, the property taxes we collect uh, as the city becomes uh, uh, more sun-baked, as climate change occurs, uh, the importance of a large mature trees will be important. but. In contrast to gray infrastructure, you can lose a significant amount of your green infrastructure over one summer. If, if it's hot and dry and people don't water, most of the gray infrastructure will tolerate uh, some degree of neglect. A living infrastructure will not. So I, I encourage you, uh, first of all, to look at the value of the existing uh, street trees. And second, if you do implement this policy, uh, provide uh, the uh, support for homeowners in terms of uh, uh, an individual or, or a fixed site that they can get information from. And uh, uh, in the sort of the, the long term, be concerned about the unintended consequences on the quality of life and the financial impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stein. Uh, and finally, uh, Carl Winty. <clears throat> Honorable Mayor and Council, my name is Carl Wente. I live just a half a mile outside of town, but Livermore is my home and that of my family. I would, as usual, like to thank you all for your service to this town. And yeah, of the people, for the people, by the people, has been said before. And quote Mahama, Mahatma Gandhi right now, a nation's greatness is measured by how it treats its weakest members. And so I do back up Mr. Scott in a way of saying, let's get it practical solutions to continue to make a difference and move the needle the best that we can and take Mr. Mahatma Gandhi's words to heart of how we treat the destitute out there and not have it grow any further. So support that one. As always, I thank those in uniform that got to put on a vest to go to work for the public safety. Um, I support everybody that comes up and has something to say as the inert citizen is the, is the biggest detriment to democracy itself and to our democratic republic. So again, I'd like to compliment the city staff. Government, by definition, is an imperfect system, but we continue to do a good job. I salute the staff for what they do, how they run this fundamental organization. We live in a great place, and I thank you all for continuing to uh, put forth that effort to make this a better place. So thank you for what you do. And 
I did uh, show up to the rules and norms and rules and regulations, and I said you're supposed to address the entire body and council as a whole. You're not supposed to pick out individuals. But Trish, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wente. Okay, that concludes the uh, Citizens Forum. Uh, moving on to the consent calendar. Got a couple of cards for that, I'm sure. <clears throat> okay, does anybody wish to uh, pull any items for consideration on the consent calendar at this point? Uh, okay, let me, uh, I have cards. Let us, uh, okay, I have people that wish to speak on 4.04 .04 and 4.06. So let us, uh, uh, can I have a motion for 4.01 to 4.03? Uh, 4.05 and 4.07. So moved. Okay, it's been moved. So moved. Second. Uh, motion made by uh, Councilmember Monroe, seconded by Councilmember Carling. Um, any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passed unanimously. Uh, okay, uh, I have two cards for uh, 4.04, one for 4.06. I have a couple of questions on 4.04 .04, um, myself. Uh, okay, so uh, obviously this is what I used to do. <laughs> I, I sampled more tanks than I can recall. Uh, so is it going to be a, a single out inlet outlet or is it going to be a, uh, uh, an inlet and a separate outlet? Uh, it'll be a single inlet outlet. Okay, one of the concerns that I have for single inlet outlets uh, is, especially in Livermore where it's hot, um, the water in the tank, it, it's filled from, uh, the ins from the bottom and the warm water flows to the top and the cool water just goes, so it, it floats and the water never actually circulates and you get water quality degradation, increased water age, uh, and potential for higher tri trihalomethanes. So we will have uh, mechanical mixers in the tank that will in ensure that the water is uh, mixed appropriately and uh, stays safe. Oh, yeah, there were those those uh, tripod packs things? I I'm not sure the exact design. Uh, they are. Oh, the packs? Okay, uh, we test of those. Uh, it, it, it's a really cool technology, and it's a very small propeller, mm -hmm. uh, but the velocity really gets the motion going in the, uh, uh, and it breaks up the stratification because it's very important. Um, and uh, uh, sampling ports. Uh, a lot of times the only place you get to sample it is from the influent effluent structure. Are you going to have sample ports throughout the tank? There will be uh, sample ports throughout the tank, a total of nine sample ports. Okay, and again, depending on uh, um, the residence time in the tank, uh, is it going to be possible to uh, chlorinate uh, the tank? Yes, it will. Okay. Uh, we had one of our reservoirs. Uh, the only way to chlorinate it was to get into a boat uh, and row around the reservoir <laughs> dumping a, a, a chlorine carboy. Uh, so it's, it's, a little, <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit rough. So, uh, okay, very good. Thank you. Can I um, as long as we're on asking questions, where is this tank located? Uh, it is located west of Vasco. We have a west map of west here. Of oh, okay. Raymond Road. Raymond Road. So it's Ames. north of 5A. Let's see if we have a map. Okay. That's okay. That's good enough. Um, and we're increasing the size from 2 million to 3.4 million gallons. Right. And the the reason for that is just to provide the additional safety for fires and with the growth of the city, we think that a 50-year-old tank with 2 million gallons is probably a little right. short of what we might need with the current population. And Right. Since, our two, since we did our 2004 water master plan, since that time we've identified the need for a larger tank. So it largely is to meet the needs of a, a growing community. And the repairs that we considered are just way too expensive and wouldn't work for the current tank? Right. The tank was built in the 60s and has yeah. been repaired several times since then, since but then. Uh, it is at the end of its useful life. Okay, great. Thank you. And one of the things, uh, I remember seeing the films of uh, uh, some of our tanks, and it was actually kind of cool. You actually chlorinate the diver, and then the diver goes into the tank. Uh, but Because uh, water quality is what we care about. Uh, but to see the, uh, the iron flock uh, this this sort of fluffy iron flock about that thick uh, on the, the the floor of the tank was was pretty impressive. Uh, of course, that iron comes from one place, and that's from the walls. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, and there is thought of protection in place. Huh? Yes, there okay. is. And that extends the life of the tank. Yes. So it'll last 50 years. Right. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any other questions, comments at this point? Okay. Um, I have a uh, card from uh, uh, for item 4.04 uh, .04 for Connie Cops uh, and then Carl Wente. So on January 11th, I came to the city clerk with a letter. Did you get it yes, on this issue? It was date stamped, um, she time stamped. I think this is exactly the letter, but I'm not sure. I think I might have grabbed a rough draft here. And it states that the city of Livermore and the county of Alameda and other lead agencies that govern um, the water in the North Livermore area have not been transparent, I don't believe. Um, I to decide this issue of changing out um, this project um, is huge. It was um, so little explained about the historical significance. I think it's wrong. Um, when did the city acquire this reservoir? Um, in 1964, um, what other current plan is our planning commission approving for water in that area? Um, steel tanks can be repaired. Um, where are the past service logs that show the wear and tear over time? Because this is just coming up like really fast after um, a planning. Co well, this is not what my letter says. I'll comment on it later. Too much historical data on the geology, the history of the past, the real property records of how this area have changed over time, and the piggybacking of other infrastructure. It's getting swept under the rug. True records are important. Um, also, why is an area prone to water saturation and seismic activity getting increased by this amount? Why would you put all that water in one tank when you could really, um, it's gonna be 14 feet higher. Why wouldn't you, when as you get new developments, you know, have them build a storage tank. I also understand that there's extra infrastructure that um, on the ground conduits and um, other piping. Um, also a switch from PG&E. pg and &E is like in the news right now. I'm asking that you um, get some of these questions answered before you approve this project and I thank you for your respect on this matter. Thank you, Ms. Cops. Uh, Mr. Wente, 4.04. <coughs> Honorable Mayor, <coughs> Council, um, again, just want to say thank you and to the staff going through. And on some level, I will agree, like for $5.2 million spend to come up and the background on it of what, where, why, and how. That being said, I do have the utmost faith in the city, in the staff, in the engineer of how it goes about it, but I'm just here to say that uh, there are non-inert citizens out there that are paying attention to what's going all the way through. 5.2, 5.6, I forget the exact number, I apologize, is a lot of money. I trust that it is being done with the utmost full disclosure across everything and how it was. That was one of the uh, fewest pages for an item and certainly far and away the largest volume, dollar volume on the consent calendar. That being said, I support the government, the process government, and the decisions being made here, but I just continue to look forward to the utmost transparency in everything that we do. And, and before you leave, uh, do you want to take on 4.06? Sure. Can you read Help that? Help DJPA. Oh, just again, I would like to compliment the city staff, Mr. Alessio, uh, Mr. Alcala, and Mr. Roberts, and all of their wonderful staff, not to just single out those two, for the volume of work that goes into the process of government. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, with that, I'm going to close the public comments. Uh, any further questions or comments on 4.04, 4.06? I think uh, the point that you made about this goes back to the 2004 uh, update that we did. So this has been in process for a while. It, it has been in process for a while. As I mentioned, we have done some repairs to the tank over time, but it is at the end of its useful life. The new tank will meet the sizing, seismic loading uh, requirements for this area, so it will actually be safer than the old tank, uh, meeting current standards. Does it have a ring wall on it? Um, sure. Do you know if it has a ring wall on it? 
I'm not sure how the specifications on that. Okay. We can look into that. The more, more, the more re recent tanks have all, all had ring walls, right. and that's a, a seismic, seismic consideration. Right. Okay. So uh, it is uh, the most efficient option, and uh, we're looking for and a 50 year old tank. Yeah, that's uh, it's been around for a while. Okay. Very good. Uh, any more questions or comments? Uh, do I have a motion for 4.04 and 4.06? I'll move we accept 4.04 and 4.06. A motion made by uh, Councilmember Carling. No, second that. Second by Councilmember Coomber. Uh, any discussion on that motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Abstentions? That passes unanimously. Again, thank you very much for your comments. Um, there are no public hearings, uh, and the matter for consideration was pulled. Uh, so on to uh, council committee reports and matters initiated. Uh, I have nothing. It's been a slow beginning of the year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Councilmember Monroe. I ha I have a co. Okay, this is working right. Good. Um, I have a couple of things. Um, in the last week or so, I went to I attended the LCAC <coughs> meeting and uh, very much appreciate the work being done by the arts community. To, I look forward to to more of those. Um, I'm going to be coming up in, in, in the next week. I get to attend the uh, city, city League of California Cities training for new city council members. So when I come back from that, I'm going to know it all. <laughs> um, and I, I'm also going to be representing, I'm going to be going to the Women's March, Tri Valley Women's March in Pleasanton this Saturday, um, representing representing the city there as a city council member. Um, and as a private citizen, I'd just say, come on out and do that. Um, I wanted to bring, to, uh, th this Sunday, I, in the Chronicle, there was an article on a poor, titled, Poor Salinas Valley Town Doesn't Scrimp on Its Kids. And it talks about ways that uh, Gonzales has uh, involved its citizens, uh, it, the, the young people, in um, the life of the city and civic engagement. Um, I see a few here tonight, actually. Welcome. Um, and um, I, Cub Scouts, yes? Yep, yay. Um, I, I just wanted to pass the article along, no action, but just sort of within the idea that as we move towards civic engagement, um, this is something we can do. So I've conveniently copied it for everybody. Um, and we'll pass it along there. Um, and finally, um, I appreciate, uh, first of all, uh, is Andrew Barker still here? Yeah. I appreciate what you said. Yeah, public safety is more than police and fire, um, although we think of it that way. It's also more than, than transportation. It, it covers a wide range, but I appreciate the comment. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, I also appreciate the comment by Van Rainey about possibly an environmental commission. I don't know what the cost of that would be, but I am curious, are there other people who might be interested in sending that to, for a... Uh, from uh, yeah. staff from that. Yeah. We can. Um, we had for a, a long time, actually, more than 20 years, a uh, Energy and Environment Committee. We can give you a little background on that, as well as sort of what the costs and advantages uh, of uh, that might be. Mm -hmm. Do we need to have three, or just... just you saw so I was doing is looking oh, for no, the I nodding up there. Okay, yeah. great. So while you were talking, other people finish. were agreeing with you. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Well, that's me. I'm done. We'll uh, we'll provide a memo to the council. Okay. Councilmember Warner. Yeah, I, I resonated with the thought of the uh, committee on the environment and how we could do that, and you know that might go into the larger picture of how we um, manage the city and all our advisory bodies. That's another larger question. And the, the other um, thing with uh, what Mr. Barker said on the, uh, the streets, uh, that's also intriguing. And it might be interesting to just suggest if that were to be considered where. And uh, it, would that mean uh, downtown in a further case? Or just if it, if it were possible, what would be the first one or two places you might try it? So is that a request for information back to the council on that? Sure. Okay, we can provide that. In fact, your active transportation plan um, in dealing with bike lanes and buffer zones has some of that built into it, but we can actually provide you a more complete answer to that in a memo. Right. I mean, just I mean, it's a, 
it's a good observation, and you know what are, what are our thoughts on it? And then uh, the other one was uh, when Mr. Stein talked about the uh, the tree shift, and I think we're, the whole thing with the sidewalks and the trees is coming back to us, correct? So maybe that um, Mr. Stein's comment could be explicitly addressed. Vice Mayor Carley? Yes, thank you. So <clears throat> on the 9th, I had a community monitor commission uh, meeting. That's to look at the, uh, sort of the group of us that monitor the monitor. The monitor is the one that looks at the ultimate landfill and uh, how well they are doing out there. So that was the meeting uh, last week. I also had a stop waste meeting last week. And uh, Council Member Monroe and I both attended the Human Services Commission meeting on the 8th. And speaking of homeless, uh, which was the subject uh, of that meeting, I did a ride along with the city manager and uh, two officers from the um, homeless liaison team on the 17th of December. Uh, just before the holiday break, and uh, the two officers are Matt Ishmael and Dave Martin, and I have to say that they're two of the more compassionate and patient people I have run into. Um, they do an amazing job for this city in dealing with helping the homeless and um, trying to understand the plight of particularly the people that are living on the street or in tents and so on. Um, we made three different stops that uh, that afternoon, um, and I was just enormously impressed. And I don't, I guess the point in me talking about this is um, not that we're ever going to solve this homeless problem, because I think that's a stretch, as Mr. Uh, Scott pointed out. Um, but I do think that the city should be proud of the people that we have dealing with the homeless. And I think the, the folks that work for the chief um, the police officers and the and these particular homeless liaison officers are to be given a tremendous amount of credit. I mean, they put their heart and soul into this, and uh, to help these folks that are down on their luck. And um, I just want to commend both Matt and Dave for uh, taking me around, and I look forward to uh, working, continuing to work with Councilmember Monroe and addressing some of the many issues that the homeless deal with. And I appreciate Mr. Scott reminding us about this uh, at every one of our meetings that we have here. So I appreciate him speaking to us each uh, council meeting. So I hope he continues to do that and keep our feet to the fire because he's right. If, if we aren't reminded of this, um, we won't make any progress. So again, I want to congratulate the chief on that uh, liaison officers and uh, again thank Mr. Scott for keeping us apprised of what's going on. Thank you Vice Mayor. On uh, January 9th uh, I was at the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce Business Alliance uh, committee meeting. We had a, a presentation on broadband and uh, fiber uh, installations which are being done proactively by Comcast. One of the problems we've had uh, is businesses won't go into an area unless uh, uh, the high-speed fiber and uh, uh, broadband is there, uh, and the companies have not been willing to install broadband and high-speed uh, fiber uh, unless the businesses are there. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing, uh, and this is something that I brought up uh, several years ago to Comcast, and they have now proactively uh, taken this on, and so now they're uh, getting a lot of places ready for business in, uh, in Livermore. Uh, also, that same evening, I was at the Alameda County uh, Mayor's Conference uh, that was uh, uh, in Dublin, and uh, uh, of course, the uh, CASA Compact came up on that. Uh, on uh, the 10th, there's the uh, Local Agency Formation Commission, where we went over the schedules for the uh, municipal uh, reviews that uh, we do as far as uh, providing services. Uh, water, police, fire, sewer, um, uh, all the infrastructure that goes in to, to make cities work. We also went over the budget. Um, on the uh, uh, 12th uh, at, uh, Livermore, at uh, Granada High School, uh, I was there for the math counts 
program. Uh, this is a competition for middle schoolers. Uh, you want to feel real humble. Uh, they rattle off these math questions, and these kids pop out the answers while you're still reading the problem. Uh, it is remarkable. These kids are incredibly sharp. Uh, and it was there for the awards program on that. Um, and uh, today, the Alameda County Transportation Commission, we had the 580 uh, Express Lane Committee. Uh, in November, there were 670,000 uh, vehicle trips taken in the uh, uh, express lanes. The average trip uh, paid $2.41 uh, with a high of 13 bucks. Um, and in fiscal year uh, 18, um, well, through November of 2018, fiscal year 18, 19, there were 3.7 million trips. And um, so far, the revenue from July to November, $6.1 million. The operating expenses are uh, $2.3 million. And all those dollars stay within that transportation corridor. Uh, planning policy and ledge committee, which followed, uh, we went over the tra county transportation plan. And one of the things that came up was uh, the uh, cut through traffic and the speed of cut through traffic and uh, how ways always seems to come up. Uh, about uh, uh, people cutting through and, and the speed with which they do that. Now, some cities have actually taken uh, uh, steps to uh, like outlaw turns, and they actually have signs up there saying, don't trust your app. And people are shocked when they get pulled over for making what is an illegal like, right turn, for example, between the hours of 7 and 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so uh, uh, that's, that's becoming a problem. Uh, and it goes into what you were talking about, uh, you know, narrowing the streets, slowing people down. Uh, speed tables and speed bumps have been an effective means of slowing traffic down. They've tried that on Tesla Road. And what people are doing now, they are passing on the speed tables and actually going onto the shoulder to pass uh, at the speed tables. So it's actually made it actually worse and more dangerous. So as you try to find engineering solutions, uh, some of the bad players just become more clever. Um, yeah, I get, uh, yeah, <laughs> as, as comment to my left here was Ann Dummer. Uh, yeah, I'm, I've almost gotten hit a number of times in the schools, uh, you know, walking into the schools. And uh, uh, it's interesting because a lot of it is blamed on, on cut through traffic. <coughs> a lot of it is traffic that's local, that's generated to people that actually live in your neighborhoods. Uh, and they say, well, we need more traffic enforcement out there. We need more. And when you stop them, then I get the email saying, well, why are you stopping traffic? Why aren't you out there catching burglars or real criminals? No, we're out here protecting our children. Heavens, where'd that come from? Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, but, I've got mine on silence, <laughs> so that's not supposed to happen. Um, so uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, suggestion. I know that there have been streets that we've been living more where they're intentionally more narrow, um, and uh, uh, but that doesn't always slow people down. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting study to see where that goes because a lot of the uh, complaints I get, people that live within the neighborhoods uh, are, are rotting through the neighborhoods. and. We have 300 miles of streets, uh, and we have 90 officers, um, and we've got we've got an award-winning traffic uh, uh, enforcement program. We won six years in a row on that. But um, do the math. You've got what 14 schools, 300 miles of roads, 90 police officers, uh, and incalculable number of of anxious uh, mothers that are in a hurry uh, driving kids to school. So uh, uh, it's a big problem, and it just involves a lot of uh, uh, a lot of coordination and a lot of effort. So certainly appreciate the comments, and we're all looking for, for solutions. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hire more police officers, but uh, um, that's and, and the chief would love that too. But uh, that's going to be uh, uh, another discussion. We just it comes down to, to, to revenue as well. Uh, also. Uh, this was astonishing. Heard about uh, East Bay mud. There was a program proposal in East because we're talking about how, what happens to streets, and uh, um, East Bay mud pretty much requires um, that streets are torn up every single year, mm -hmm. because for every house has to replace the sewer lateral at the time of sale. So rather than 
replace all the sewer laterals. When the house closes sale, they have to, the, the contractors come out and dig up the street. So pretty much any time there's going to be a street torn up one time or another as East Bay Mud sewer ladle. So thank goodness we don't have that one. Um, and uh, so then we also talked about the CASA compact, uh, which is uh, uh, has been said there's pretty much something for everybody to, compl- to hate in this thing. Uh, it involves uh, the CASA. I think I might have mentioned this last time. The acronym stands for Housing the Bay Area. And if that doesn't make sense, you're right, it doesn't. Uh, but uh, what it involves is the cities that are on the steering committee uh, are the cities that have actually have caused the problem of uh, long commutes, higher tra- uh, housing costs, uh, and uh, housing jobs imbalance. Uh, and those are the cities that are on the committee. The cities are n- that are not on the committee are the ones that are going to be charged with finding the solution and paying for it. So, uh, yeah, so we're in deep discussions right now with the Alameda County Mayor's Conference. Uh, the only city in Alameda County that was included on the steering committee was the city of Oakland. And uh, uh, San Francisco and, and uh, San Jose were the other uh, big three cities that uh, are, are working on this. Uh, by the way, all three of those cities opposed a transit solution on the 580 corridor. So uh, don't look to them for any great solutions because the idea is getting the people from their uh, housing centers in San Joaquin Valley to the job centers in, in Silicon Valley. And they're looking for the uh, public agencies to subsidize the uh, commute for their workers to their jobs uh, to keep them in business. So this is going to be really interesting. Uh, MTC, this was really interesting. MTC voted to pass this, but not necessarily endorse it, uh, but they just moved it ahead uh, for the state legislature to take it over. Uh, and st- because they're going to try to do this using state legislation rather than uh, local initiatives. But it's all about uh, putting uh, more housing at transit centers, uh, getting them to uh, Silicon Valley. So uh, really interesting. Stay tuned on that one. But we talked at great length. We'll have a greater, uh, much more in-depth discussion uh, on the 31st. So uh, look for that. Uh, I'd also like to introduce our uh, uh, new uh, Director of Economic uh, Development and Innovation, Adam uh, Van Water. Uh, he's uh, uh, waved right there. He's uh, we, uh, very lucky to have him. Uh, so with that, uh, seeing no further business, uh, adjourn to uh, January uh, 20th. 20th, yes.